It's only happened three times in the last 15 years where a team drafts a quarterback in the first round, they decide to part ways with that quarterback, and that quarterback goes to another team and wins a playoff game. The first was Ryan Tannehill with Tennessee, and then it didn't happen again until this year when Baker Mayfield and Jared Goff both won playoff games after being on their second team in Jared's case or fourth team in Baker's case. I believe that Sam Darnold is going to be the fourth player on that list when the upcoming season wraps up and we're going to get into a little bit of tape and I'm going to show you why. Now, I just want to highlight that in the last five seasons, Sam Darnold has had four head coaches and five offensive coordinators. Not a recipe for success once you're drafted third overall. And unfortunately, I see a lot of guys go through different versions of the same story. Now on the positive side, you get exposed to a lot of football. You got Adam Gase, you got Kyle Shanahan, you've got Ben McAdoo, you've got a lot of different offensive input and you got a lot of different systems being installed and different ways to learn it. On the negative side, there's a long list. There's no continuity, how things are being done, Done, uncertainty heading into the next year. It's a long list. Now, if you don't know the bias, it's actually pretty thick. I've spent like over the last 10 years around this guy and spent a lot of time on the field with him. But bias aside, I, 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 I watch a lot of tape. I see what I see. I believe what I believe. Let's get into a little bit of tape here and I'll show you why I feel so strongly about this. All right, first up, this is second and five in the Rams game that he played at the end of the year. Uh, and this is a perfect example of great movement, timing, accuracy, and velocity on the ball. So he's going to go kind of like a little hybrid five and a hitch. And let's check this concept. So he's releasing, getting vertical down the field. We'll have a flat route. And he's basically running a wide depart, deeper kind of speed out, but it's speed outs are usually like at 11 yards. I think this thing ends up being, you know, 16 to 18. So it's deeper. Um, and he's essentially attacking the leverage of number one. But watch Sam's footwork. Okay, so he takes the hitch. Ideally, you want to throw this ball on that first hitch. So if you see what he sees, this receiver is breaking down right when Sam is hitching in the pocket. But because of the pressure on his left side here, he's forced to climb and throw this ball late. So he's climbing up in the pocket. Okay? So he's climbing vertically, but he's pushing the ball to the perimeter. Very, very difficult to do because you have to be able to anchor on your front side, turn that back hip to be able to drive it. Otherwise, that ball is going to carry and it's going to move left to right. And if you throw left to right on an outbreaking route, here's number one waiting on that. But that's not what happens with Sam. Hits the top of his drop, big climb here, two hands on the ball, guy wrapped around his race, and look where this ball finishes. Boom. Gives his boy a chance to actually catch it, stay in bounds, and get more yards after the catch and make a play. Let's look at it from behind. Sneaky athlete, elite basketball player, super twitchy. Gets to the top of his drop. One of the things, spent a lot of time working on this, not everybody's feet are in line with their target when they throw to the left. Little hint, hint. Getting turned at the top here. They're putting this left foot in the ground to be able to create the stability to get yourself turned. I can't tell you how many quarterbacks end up standing right here because when they hitch, they actually push themselves towards their target. And then by the way, when that left foot hits the ground, they're swinging it open, creates all sorts of issues. So many guys end up right here making it tougher on their left tackle, which in this case would have resulted in a sack. But look at, he starts right here. He ends up to the right of his original landmark. This is just great fundamentals and technique and it's repped, off, repped in the off season and it starts without a ball in your hand. But he's just to the left of this hash and he gets all the way turned and now he is in the absolute safest spot where again, imagine if he's over here, this is probably a sack, but he's able to climb and not have to take another hitch, get that foot in the ground, drives the ball to the perimeter. He's going this way, ball going that way, scary throw, that's a dime. All right, different situation, Baltimore game. This is fourth and nine. Boy, are there a lot of people in here right here. So he's feeling, gotta be feeling this is cover zero. And we end up getting somebody coming free off the edge. Jadavian County, they're squeezing, they're popping back out. And so there's a sense of urgency here where it feels like cover zero. They're dropping a defensive tackle, really the nose guard. Whatever it ends up being, there's three on three right here. We got to get this ball out of our hands and we got to know who we're going to, where we're going with the ball. So I got to know my progression. I got to have my plan versus pressure. So the progression's built in. The plan versus pressure is what impresses me. So pushing himself back, gets that right foot in the ground and look at Debo. Look at the, his hands come apart and Debo ha is still running downfield. So even though he's not the starter at this point, getting a ton of reps with the guys every day, it's on the same page as Debo. You sit here and go, well, this is a great play by Debo. It's like, well, 
right when his head turns around and he starts to rotate his hips, the ball hits him in the forehead. So it's actually very helpful from a yards after catch perspective. So Debo can make that move, get vertical, and on fourth and nine, make a very Debo Samuel-ish play, which is breaking tackles. Reminds me of Anquan Bolden back in the day. But again, Sam, look at this protection, okay? So one, two, he's popping, three, four, five. Now he's ended up coming late, but we've only got six guys in this protection. Christian's scanning across, and I'm not sure if it's a whiff or what, um, but really if Christian releases, he's got him. So I think he's, this guy is just what we call a delay, uh, blitz, a blitz delay, green dog, add-on. There's all these terms that basically mean like if the guy the running back doesn't release, stays in and protect, then go ahead and hit it and add on. As a quarterback, we got to know if my running back's staying in to protect and it's man coverage and that guy's got my guy in man, I've watched on tape. Do they delay blitz? Do they green dog? If that's the case, I can't sit back here and hold on to it. I can't take three hitches. And also, I can't try and cut through any of these A or B or C gaps because there's another dude essentially spying on me, but he's coming. So right here, Sam knows all that. He's got a sense of urgency. Get the ball out and look at the ball placement. It's hitting him in the forehead. There's going to be a theme here. Now let's go back to Panthers, Sam. Okay, this is week 12 in Carolina. Could have pulled from a lot of highlights. But how about this concept right here where we've got a little naked here planned. Okay, so this guy is going to end up running the deep over. 82 is supposed to slide into the flat. And then we're going to have a slam flat here. And we're going to essentially go 1 to 2 to 3. And everything else is window dressing. He's coming across, that's window dressing, okay? So Sam, one, it's really difficult. I, I've said this in other videos. I remember when I played in Cincinnati, our offensive coordinator would not run nakeds to the left with a right-handed quarterback because it's such a compromising position and it's so difficult to get your eyes around. And if you get the edge and you get to turn the corner, yeah, anybody can throw on the, on the run to the left if you play in the NFL. But it's when there's somebody in your face, you can't really turn and get the ball off unless you do it like this. So super dope play. Inside zone to the right, cuts off this four step, gets vertical, and uh-oh, here is somebody right in my face. But watch what Sam does here. Super scary throw, by the way. This could very easily go the other way if it's not perfect. So Sam comes out of this, and boom, he gets his vision right here and realizes something's wrong and my tight end's not in the flat. So what does he do? He puts this right foot in the ground, decelerate, left foot is your change of direction step, and he doesn't do this and flip his hips. He doesn't do this and get narrow. He does this and he gets depth off of it. It's like a step back into an uncontested shot. And then he throws it and it's nothing but net. And look at the ball placement on this throw. Look at all these guys over here, right? It's three guys. I mean, when you see what he sees, okay? You're looking right here with a guy in your face. You see one guy, two guy, three guys. And he puts this thing, the only place his boy can get it, in the back of the end zone. Again, look at the change of direction. This is the athleticism I'm talking about. Okay, inside zone to his right. Expecting that tight end to not get stuck up field. Flips his hips. Uh-oh. Flip gets depth. Creates the space between him and 56 so he can actually complete his throwing motion and then just an absolute seed to DJ Moore in the back of the end zone. Pretty special. Free agency's coming up. Sam Darnold is, I think, gonna have a lot of suitors. Just let's look at, I, I'm not breaking any info, I don't know anything. Teams with uncertain QB situations where there's at least chatter. You've got Chicago, the Commanders, Patriots, Falcons, Vikings, Broncos, Raiders, Steelers, Bucks. You know, these are the spots. I'm just saying like, there's chatter around them making a move. Now, I got a bunch of stats and feedback and all that. The reality is, is I think it's difficult to judge a quarterback being a high pick until they've been in a good situation for a year or two. In fact, I heard Dan Orlovsky talking about Bryce Young the other day, and he said, I'm not gonna evaluate Bryce Young until his third year because the situation in Carolina right now is so just kind of jacked up. This last year was bad. They're kind of more than a year away. So the second year, he was basically saying like, I'm not judging him until he's had like three seasons because he stepped into a bad situation. Okay, then why wouldn't we say that about Sam Darnold? Five seasons, four head coaches, five offensive coordinators, three teams. It's the same thing to me. And so I'm pumped to see how free agency shake out 
because been watching this for a while, I just don't see a big difference between what I've seen Sam Darnold do and what some of the best players in this league are doing. And then there's also a lot of things where I go, ooh, I think Sam's actually better than him at that. Just haven't seen it in a good setting yet. And had he been the starter in San Fran this year, we would have, that would have been a great setting. Would have been a great huddle, would have been a great play caller, would have been a great a lot of things. But Brock Purdy played his ass off and, uh, and there was never gonna be an opportunity for that. Next year, interested to see what happens because when it comes to all the things you gotta have to be an elite quarterback in this league, I look at the list of things that you gotta have to be great at this position in the league. And then I look at the list of the things that Sam Darnold can do and those lists look the same to me.